Thanks so much for joining with us. President Biden is finally traveling to the southern border. Sunday, he's going to El Paso, Texas to meet with people on the front line. Well, the president also announced a major shift in immigration policy. He's expanding legal immigration and sending a clear message to illegals. Do not just show up at the border. Abigail Robertson has the story. The Biden administration plans to allow up to 30,000 migrants per month to enter the United States legally while cracking down on those who cross illegally. The new policy includes migrants from Haiti, Venezuela, Nicaragua and Cuba. Do not, do not just show up at the border. Stay where you are and apply legally from there. According to Biden, these four countries account for the majority of those traveling through Mexico and entering the U.S. illegally. And until Congress passes the funds, a comprehensive immigration plan to fix the system completely, my administration is going to work to make things better at the border using the tools that we have available to us now. Those who qualify for asylum must have a sponsor in the United States, undergo rigorous background checks, apply from outside the U.S., and not attempt to cross illegally. This new process is orderly, it's safe, and it's humane, and it works. Matthew Sorens from World Relief says he's concerned with parts of the new policy. And some of what President Biden is proposing is actually very troubling uh, because there will be people who don't qualify for this new program who nevertheless are fleeing persecution and ought to have the right to seek asylum. That doesn't mean they get to stay necessarily, but they have the right to due process under U.S. law, and we shouldn't be rolling back those protections. According to a 2022 LifeWay research study, there is widespread evangelical support for comprehensive immigration reform. Well, four to five evangelicals say they want Congress to act on a bipartisan basis to allow dreamers to pursue citizenship, to ensure that we have more secure borders, and also to address the, the workforce issues, especially in agriculture, that are driving up food costs. Sorens agrees with the president that the solution to the broken system is a bipartisan bill to address urgent immigration issues. We do need a bunch of new resources at the border, both to ensure that we apprehend, our government apprehends individuals seeking to enter the country unlawfully, which it has not consistently been able to do in the last few years, but also to adjudicate asylum requests. People who are showing up at the border, not running away from the border patrol, but seeking the asylum under the terms of U.S. law. And right now we just have no, we're so far from having the capacity to actually adjudicate those cases that people are waiting on average more than four years for a decision. President Biden says he's willing to sit down with anyone who in good faith wants to find a solution to fix the broken immigration system. And he argues he wants to see immigration once again become a bipartisan issue. Reporting from the White House, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. Well, I will have to say it's about time the administration got into gear about the immigration problem because we're seeing millions. What he's proposing is just you know between three and four hundred thousand, but the surge of immigration under his leadership has been overwhelming, and we're now approaching three million uh, crossing the border on a yearly basis. Um, to to say okay, we're going to handle ten percent of that in a different way, just really doesn't solve the problem at all. I'm, I'm glad he's finally calling for Congress to act, but where was that last year? Where was that the year before? And I remind everyone he had complete control of Congress at that point in time, and there could have been comprehensive immigration reform. The likelihood of Republicans and Democrats getting together right now to do something, I just, uh, I just don't see it, but I hope they do. And I'm one of the ones that, yes, dreamers, uh, the children born uh, and, and outside the United States, but co coming into the United States or children of illegal immigrants born here. All of these things need to be solved and be solved very quickly. In other news, doctors say NFL player DeMar Hamlin is showing remarkable improvement. And if, if you don't know this story, I, I don't know where you've been this week because he collapsed last Monday night in a game in Cincinnati. He turned the National Football League into the National Prayer League. And it's great to see an answer to prayer. Ephraim Graham has that story from the CBN Newsroom. Ephraim? Gordon, indeed, an answer to prayer. Hamlin began to wake up Wednesday night. Thursdays, doctors shared he'd started to communicate in writing with his family and others. 
first question that he wrote when he when he started to awaken was was did we win? Yes, you know, Damari, you won. You've won the game of life. It's not only that the lights are on. We know that he's home, uh, and that it appears that all all the cylinders are firing. Doctors say Hamlin's neurological function is intact, meaning he can follow commands and move. That marks a really good turning point in his care. After Hamlin collapsed Monday, his Buffalo Bill teammates prayed on the field. People around the country swiftly joining in, lifting Hamlin up to heaven. The good news about Hamlin's recovery came as the Bills returned to the practice field yesterday, with Coach Sean McDermott making it clear the Bills are still praying for their teammates. Uh, we continue to pray for them during this time, uh, and DeMar uh, is and, and remains our number one concern. Ham remains in the intensive care unit at the University of Cincinnati Medical Center as people across the country continue prayers for his speedy recovery. Turning overseas now, one of the oldest Christian cultures in the world, Armenia, faces a potential human tragedy as tensions rise with the neighboring country of Azerbaijan. Experts worry about what's ahead because of the deadly fighting and a blockade that cut off food and important resources. Billy Hallowell has the story. There is, there is no time to uh, wait and to uh, allow the next genocide because this is genocide. That's how Dr. Bayana Sukhudian describes the situation in Nagorno-Karabakh, a small landlocked region between Armenia and Azerbaijan. For decades, deadly battles between Armenians and Azerbaijanis have raged there, and a recent blockade has reignited those tensions. The last big war in Karabakh happened in 2020, and at that time, Azerbaijan conquered most of the territory all around the enclave. And so there's only one road that connects the 120,000 Christians who live in this enclave to the rest of the world. And um, it's protected by a Russian peacekeeping force. On December 12th, Azerbaijani protesters reportedly blocked that road, known as the Lachin Corridor, preventing food, medicine, and other basic transport in or out of Nagorno-Karabakh. I'm a pediatric neurologist. Together with my colleague, we um, saw many children with epilepsy um, who have to take anti-seizure drug to um, get free of seizures, but now there is shortage of these drugs. And not only these drugs are not available, but also some painkillers and antibiotics, as well as hormonal therapy, which is very important in acute situations. In addition with that, there is a um, shortage of baby formulas. The blockade sparked immediate condemnation with critics across the world calling on Azerbaijan to halt the obstruction. Ruben Vardanyan, Minister of State for Nagorno-Karabakh, believes the region's most recent battles stem, in part, from a clash of worldviews. One public is a democratic country against the non-democratic, autocratic country, because in Azerbaijan, everybody knows we don't have a democratic system, and we all know that the we own citizens, Azeris, they don't have a right to uh, really uh, human rights. With both Armenia and Azerbaijan laying claim to this land, the dynamic is complex. Armenia gained control in the early 1900s, and then a 2020 Russian-brokered ceasefire handed Azerbaijan newfound control. Joel Veldkamp is among those who worry the worst is yet to come for Armenia, one of Christianity's oldest communities. I think this is probably the prelude to an Azerbaijani armed attack on Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, and if that happens and Russia does not step in, Armenia is probably not strong enough to stop them from conquering the whole region. There will be massacres. And at the end of it, this land, which is the ancient homeland of the Armenian people, this is where their alphabet was designed as some of the oldest churches in the world, will be completely destroyed. This is Billy Hollowell for CBN News. Here in the United States and in other countries, as the new year begins, resolutions are usually a big subject. For many Christians, spending more time in the Bible tops that list, including reading it all in a year. As Wendy Griffith reports, many resources are available that can help turn that resolution into a reality. It's a big book, and for Christians, it's the most important book that we ever read. But for many, it can also be the most challenging, especially if you want to read the entire Bible in a year. Actress Patricia Heaton reached that goal in December. And I finished it today. I can't believe it. I had two pages 
that I checked off all the time. And this is the second page. And um, as you can see, it's hanging on by a piece of tiny thread of paper. Um, I just went through and kept checking off and checking off every day. You know, some days were just revelatory. I saw things I had never seen before. And some days were kind of a slog, mostly Old Testament stuff. Known for her TV roles in Everybody Loves Raymond and The Middle, Heaton used a reading plan from the Gospel Coalition to help her with her goal. At CBN, we make it easy as well. Just go to CBN.com, click the Faith tab, and subscribe to Read Through the Bible in a Year. Each day, you'll receive selections from the Old and New Testament delivered straight to your email. You can also download the CBN Devotional Bible app for a plan to read the entire Bible in a year. Some may wonder why so few Christians have read the entire Bible, all 66 books, from Genesis to Revelation. Dr. Corne Becker, Dean of Divinity at Regent University says, So I often think we are a little bit intimidated by the history sections, as well as the law sections within the Old Testament. But once we discover that it is life-giving to read all of God's Word, to get the wisdom of the entire text, not only does it become doable, easy, but it becomes delightful. Dr. Becker should know. He's read through the Bible 25 times and makes it a yearly discipline. What are the benefits of reading the Bible from Genesis to Revelation straight through? So there's an extraordinary text in Psalms 19 that describes the benefits of meditating on God's Word on a daily basis. And listen to what it says. The law of the law is perfect reviving the soul. Isn't that something that we need? Secondly, it says the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Man, do I need wisdom. I need wisdom on a daily basis. Then it goes on, it says the precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. And then lastly, it says the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes, opens our eyes to see what is ultimately true. So if you've always wanted to read through the Bible in a year, but haven't had the time, you might be surprised to know that it only takes an average of 15 to 30 minutes a day, five days a week, to read through the entire Bible in a year. And who knows, once you've done it, reading the Bible through may become a yearly habit. Uh, I highly recommend it. Wendy Griffith, CBN News. Solution two years ago, but worth doing again, Gordon. All right. Well, it's worth doing. And when you when you do it and when you do it and say, OK, I'm going to attempt it and not just attempt it, but actually do it on a daily basis, it does change your life. You start to see things that you hadn't seen before. You start to see patterns you hadn't seen before. I was talking to a dear friend just yesterday who had just gone through the Gospel of John and they were amazed that, you know, the things that sort of popped up, the repeating patterns when you say, I'm going to read through and I'm going to read through it in sequence. Uh, it's wonderful what happens. And then you start to see some, some patterns. And for me, it was forever getting through Leviticus. It was forever getting through Numbers and then all the genealogies. And then my eyes got open to the theology of the genealogies, how you could see God working through the generations. It's wonderfully inspiring. So I'm not asking you to do what Dr. Becker does and say, I'm going to read through the Bible 25 times in my life. No, I'm not asking for that. I'm saying if you would like to sign up for our Read Through the Bible in a Year program, and this is going to be really simple, in your email inbox every day will be a reminder with the passage, a link to the passages for that day. And so it'll take you 15 minutes a day. That's all I'm asking for. We'll make it easy for you. So if you'd like to have the Bible in a Year program, go to cbn.com. There's a place where you can click on the link Faith at the top of the page. And then on the Faith page, scroll down to the right-hand side and click on Subscribe under Bible Reading Plans. And you, this time, next year, will be able to be like Patricia Heaton and say, I did it. Yeah, it's actually a goal of mine this year. My, my best friend gave me, shout out to you, Brittany, if you're watching, um, she gave me an actual, it's a Bible specifically geared towards for women, and it's the Bible through the year, so 
page one is January 1, and it gives you a portion of Genesis, and then it gives you a portion of the New Testament, which is Matthew, and then uh, the Psalms and Proverbs. So it kind of organizes it for you. Yeah. And yeah, it's a, it's a good book. And when we're done all this, I'll recommend reading through the Torah, the Torah cycles. The United States has long prided itself on being a military superpower. Yet recently, our military received a failing grade from an annual report on the strength of America's defense forces. Our country is lagging behind while our adversaries, like China, are increasing their military power. Caitlin Burke explains why this is happening and what we need to do to retain our status as the world's most powerful military. Inflation, a recruiting crisis, aging equipment, and years of budget cuts. All factors weighing into a nonpartisan 2023 U.S. index of military strength. Heritage's conclusion, the United States military is not prepared to meet the current threat environment of an increasingly dangerous world. We assess the overall status of the military as weak and that's meant to convey a level of gravity. Breaking down the findings by branch, the Army comes in at marginal, seen as aging faster than it's modernizing and much smaller than needed. The Navy rated as weak with a rapidly decreasing fleet. A similar rating for the Space Force, which lacks the capacity to manage the explosive growth in space we're seeing from other countries, while the Air Force rates lowest at very weak due to retention issues and aging equipment. The only bright spot among the branches being the Marine Corps, with a strong rating, having adapted well to the needs of today. U.S. nuclear capability is also rated and determined to be strong thanks to a bipartisan commitment to modernization in that area. Index editor Dakota Wood says as of today, the U.S. military as a whole would struggle to meet the demands of a single major conflict, let alone engage on multiple fronts. So if we got involved in some kind of a NATO-Russia thing in Europe, and you really had to focus on that because of interests and obligations, then you don't have an ability to do anything in the Indo-Pacific. And so if you were China and you look at a tied-up America, wouldn't that be an opportune time to then try to retake Taiwan, right? Wood says while funding is the ultimate problem, it's also the solution. In order to get the military back to fighting strength, spending would need to increase meaning the defense budget would need to come in significantly over the rate of inflation. So it's going to require both parties, and it's going to require both branches, the, the, the legislative branch and the executive branch, to agree to dramatically in increase defense spending. The defense authorization bill for 2023 gives the military a record $858 billion, $45 billion more than President Biden requested. While that keeps pace with inflation, Wood says it falls short of what's really needed. It's going to take many years of serious investment uh, to get things back to where they should be. America's adversaries, meanwhile, are steadily increasing investments into their military might. You're seeing the Chinese military on track to triple, not double, triple, the amount of nuclear warheads it has on station. Uh, they are out building us in ships at a rate of five to one. Uh, their, their Navy is on track to be almost double the size of the U.S. Navy. Uh, by the end of the decade, their Space Force is launching more. We've seen what Russia's doing, Iran marching towards a nuclear weapon. Uh, we, we can go around the world. Representative Mike Waltz, a House Armed Services Committee member, says it's time for the U.S. to stop playing catch up. You're going to see this Congress uh, work to get, and this Republican-led Congress, to get the Pentagon back on its core mission of war fighting, of deterring wars by appearing strong to our adversaries. That's how you keep the peace. Wood warns that's usually easier said than done, as it would require Congress to prioritize projects that won't show immediate benefits. You know, if I get my student loans canceled or something like that, right, that helps me today. If I build a new submarine, well, that won't go into the water for five or six years. He hopes the ongoing war in Ukraine will remind lawmakers of how expensive war would be with another major power, far different from what the U.S. military faced over the last two decades in the Middle East. You know, non-state terrorist actors with no Navy, no Air Force, you know, no Army in any conventional sense. And so we have gotten used to this idea that a smaller, 
older, not well-equipped military in this sense is able to do everything that we would want it to do, but that's a false sense of security. When it comes to recommendations, Wood would be encouraged by a significant and consistent investment in munitions, especially since the U.S. has provided Ukraine with more than a quarter of our supply. Then in the coming years, he suggests an increase in defense spending and a renewed focus on expanding the military's capacity. Caitlin Burke, CBN News, Washington. As alarming as this report is, there's something even more alarming. How much military can we all afford? When you look at the ongoing deficits that our federal government is spending out every single year, and now 30 trillion in debt, how much can we afford? Uh, the Bank of America, and I've quoted this before, but I think it's worth quoting again. This is about a decade ago. They, they issued a report um, having concern, can we even afford a military in a high deficit situation where your interest payments on your debt start to exceed the amount of money you're spending on entitlement programs? We're very close to that. And the more the Federal Reserve raises interest rates, it's raising rates on that deficit and the amount of money that we have to borrow, that cost of borrowing goes up. Those interest payments have to be paid. Otherwise, the entire financial system goes into uh, haywire if the federal government ever defaults on an interest payment. So, you know, how much is that? How much are we spending on interest on 30 trillion? We'll just start doing the math of how many billion it takes on an interest payment uh, on a $30 trillion debt. You add one interest percentage point, you're adding uh, $100 billion uh, to $10 trillion. I mean, it, it, these, these numbers start to stagger you. And at that point in time, it becomes unsustainable. We're fast approaching that. And nobody's raising the, the, the big flag to say, uh, wait a minute, guys, we're spending ourselves into oblivion. And it's not a question of, is our military eroding, but is the entire economy, entire government, are we going to default on our bonds? Is that going to throw the world economy into a deep recession? Is this going to crater everything? Uh, no one's looking at that. Nobody's paying attention to that. But Bank of America said it about a decade ago. How much can we afford? And in our interest payments, are we going to spend ourselves into oblivion? Ashley? Well, in 2014, the movie Left Behind, starring Nicolas Cage, earned more than $30 million at the box office worldwide. The sequel to the film opens in select theaters on January 26th. Left Behind, The Rise of the Antichrist, stars Kevin Sorbo and, his, and also features his wife, Sam Sorbo. And here's a sneak peek. If someone had told me that millions of people were just going to disappear, I, like you, would have said they were crazy. Was it the rapture? I saw it happen. The world is suffering. We are on the brink of mass insanity. What happens to the rest of us? Doesn't it seem strange that it's still so easy to dismiss it, even though we saw it with our own eyes? Left Behind, Rise of the Antichrist will be in theaters nationwide for a limited run beginning January 26th. All right. Well, welcome back to the 700 Club, Kevin and Sam Sorbo. Thank you guys so much for being with us this morning. It's great to be here. Thanks for having us. You guys Very are... excited about this movie. Very excited. Oh, my gosh. So are we. And you guys are in California, right? No, we live in Florida. We left oh, California four years ago. I was going to say, you guys are up really early, but we're on the same time zone, I think. So, well, welcome <laughs> right. back to the club. We're so happy to have you guys. Your new movie is a sequel to the 2014 movie Left Behind. Where does your movie pick up in that storyline? It's uh, actually six months later now. So it's, it's time for people to... Uh, either deny what had happened or make up stories about what had happened for people to sort of do a little bit of soul searching and find their way back to uh, having hope and redemption in their lives. And it's, uh, it's a wonderful movie with a great cast. And Sean McDonough was amazing and Corbin Burnson, uh, Bailey Chase, um, Sam's in it. I mean, it's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she goes, hits me. <laughs> well, what current events do you guys feature in the film? 
Oh, that's the that's the most amazing thing. So right before they went to shoot, the director or producer said, wait, wait, wait. I need to rewrite the script. And he wrote in a story. He wove in a pandemic that has recently happened into the storyline. So it really uh, it addresses a lot of what we've been seeing in the culture recently and uh, and in politics and stuff without getting too specific, without drilling down into actual events it sort of reflects the act the the events that we've all just and it, it was through. it was the producer i directed by the way so oh my god sorry, producer writer <laughs> you said director producer i i meant writer i'm sorry the writer producer don't take away that hard work ahead of so you did a masterful job and um and so it does it, it's a little bit of a commentary in fact i love the subtitle of the film a true story that hasn't happened yet no mm. Wow, that's powerful. Well, Kevin, tell us about the character that you specifically play in the film. Well, I took over the role that Nicolas Cage did in the movie eight years ago, Rayford Steele, a pilot in it. And he's going through his own, uh, you know, six months now since his wife has disappeared and his son has disappeared. And he always sort of made fun of her for her religious beliefs. But now he he knows what had happened. And uh, he he's admitting to it that he was wrong. So he's on his own search right now to find out uh, what happened to his wife, how it happened to his wife. He goes to the church that she goes to. Uh, you see in there, um, in that trailer, the pastor is still there, which I love that they wrote that in there, that not every pastor is going to be saved because you see what's going on in our world right now with the with the woke culture happening everywhere. So it was a wonderful journey for, for me to play as a character that comes to a place of redemption and hope in his life. Yeah, that seems to be a character that you like to play from your other movies as well. True. Yeah, well, Sam, uh, what happens in the scene that you and Kevin actually have together? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, without giving away too much, you know, I'm playing a character who is also struggling with her faith, who knew his wife and just could never bring herself to to buy in. And so now she's she's actually opened her eyes to seeing what's actually going on. And I like it because... I, my work in education uh, sort of puts me in the position of trying to convince people that they've been deluded by their schools into believing that the schools are actually accomplishing education. So it's sort of a parallel uh, thing. And so to portray this um, this person coming to truth is uh, very powerful. I think the scene, it was a very, very emotional scene. Yeah. Um, and it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, how was it acting with one another? I mean, I know that's how you guys met, right? You met on set of Hercules. Like, do you enjoy being around one another on set or is it something difficult or does it come natural? I think we have good battles, but they're creative <laughs> battles, which is a good thing. No, but it, it is. I mean, I, everybody's got their idea what scenes should be played out. I mean, everybody reads a book. They all say the book is better than a movie because there's reasons for that because we all have a different picture in our mind as we're reading scripts and books. But um, she has great ideas. I think I have great ideas. I'm always open to listen to other people. I mean, I don't go on the set and, and tell everybody what they need to do because being an actor, I know what it's like to be on that side of the camera as well. So I love actors to work things out amongst themselves on sets because when you're on a location, it's quite different than what the writer wrote sitting in his office somewhere. Mm -hmm. So uh, I like to open it up and, and let people be creative. Because, and it's just like spending time with him. So and, it works for me. Well, it's, it's, and it's, it's, you know, they love it so much. Paula Lund and, 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 you know, Jessica Parker, they put together a really, really good script. And yeah. uh, they, they love this one so much. They said they're working on the next one already. And hopefully we start filming that at the end of this year to continue the Left Behind it's series. And for me, what's really kind of cool about it is, um, you know, Jerry Jenkins along with Tim LaHaye were the writers of the Left Behind books. Well, Jerry Jenkins funded the very first faith-based movie I ever did called What If, which was directed by his son, Dallas Jenkins, who's now doing quite well, a little thing called The Chosen. Yep. So this is kind of like a full circle for the thing, me to be part of the left behind, yeah. uh, you know, just the great world that that uh, 80 million books, I think they sold. So yeah. this is pretty cool for me to be part of this. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. Well, the people uh, left behind in the movie get a second chance. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, it's up to each individual, right? I mean, you're still going to have deniers out there. You're still going to have people that are, are so strong in their atheism or non-belief, whatever that may be. Yeah. So I think the best place, we got to get a quick plug, leftbehindmovie.com, though. If you go to leftbehindmovie.com, you can find out um, uh, where it's showing in your neighborhood. You get the trailer, the full trailer, and January 26th is when we open. And it's four days only. And yeah. so what I'm, what I'm encouraging people to do is go to leftbehindmovie.com, 
find a screening that you want to go to, mm -hmm. buy tickets, and then send the link to your friends and ask them to join you at the theater. I've sold out, I think, two theaters now. We're working on some. Well, we're on 1,500 screens. That's pretty darn good. Yeah, you so know, it 1, will be 1,500 screens. So go check it out. If you fill up those theaters, trust me, they'll, they'll carry it over for the next week. And the other thing that I want to say is it's a great movie to share with people mm -hmm. because we want, we want to spread truth, right? And so if you can bring your friends to just to the point of them trying to find truth to discovery. Like Kevin and I lead a trip to Israel. We're, we're leading another tour to Israel in May. And it's for people to, to see like some of the history that actually happened. Yeah. Go, go to the Holy Land and experience that. And so that's the idea because we want to be more firm in our faith. We want to we want to grow our faith. And it's too easy these days to just go, well, I'll think about that tomorrow. I'll, I'll do that later. Uh, now is the time. By the way, we ca we're capping the trip in May to Israel. We only have eight uh, spots left open. So if you want to go a trip of a lifetime, go to uh, SorboIsraelTrip.com. SorboIsraelTrip.com. You won't be disappointed. May 17th through the 28th this spring. All right. Well, you guys got so much going on. I love it. I love what you guys are about. Thank you so much for being with us today. And I want to let everyone know at home, at home know, Left Behind Rise of the Antichrist opens in select theaters nationwide as a Fathom event beginning January 26th. And for more information on tickets, we have a link available at CBN.com. Kevin and Sam, God bless you guys and all the things that you're doing. Thank, Thank you. you. All. Happy, we appreciate Happy New Year, everyone. You. Thank you so much. Welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN news break. California was pounded Thursday by a storm that brought hurricane force winds, surging surf and heavy rains, knocking out power to tens of thousands, causing flooding and contributing to the deaths of at least two people, including a toddler whose home was crushed by a falling tree. The seaside village of Capitola in Santa Cruz County suffered possibly the worst damage as waves that were forecast to top 25 feet crashed into homes and restaurants. CBN's Operation Blessing is providing housing for those in need. Dorcas, a single mother, lived in a small one-room mud hut in Peru with her three children who still lived at home. They slept on the hard, uneven ground on a blanket. Rain seeped through the roof and the cold wind blew through cracks in the walls and the walls began to crumble as well. She prayed every day for a good house. Well, prayers were answered when Operation Blessing heard about her situation and provided her with a brand new home complete with a kitchen, bathroom and new beds. A grateful Dorcas thanked Operation Blessing saying, God made this happen through you. You can learn more about Operation Blessing by visiting ob.org. Susanna and her three sons live in a shanty made from scrap metal. It's a step up from the lean-to tarp they once lived in. Still, their desperate situation never stopped Susanna from dreaming. And one day, you made her dream come true. Susanna is a single mother raising her three boys alone. For a whole year after her husband abandoned them, she lived in a lean-to made of tree branches and a tarp near Quito's Peru. When we used to live in the lean-to, the wind blew it down and we all got wet. We woke up shivering from the cold. Eventually, Susanna moved to a piece of land given to her by her brother. There, she built a shanty made of scraps of wood and cast off metal sheets. I suffered a lot with my boys. When the rains come with strong winds, we felt the house move. The roof made noises, and my sons got scared and cried. This is seven-year-old Ezekiel. Sometimes it rained hard. When the wind blew and the rain came in, we got wet. Susanna did her best to improve the house and roof whenever she found a new piece of metal or scrap of wood. This place did not have a good roof or strong walls. We had to eat on the floor, and we didn't have a bathroom. Susanna also struggled to find work. She sold snacks, but her daily income was limited. There was only enough money for them to eat one meal a day. What hurts me is seeing my little brother cry for food because mom comes home late at night. She worries about my little brother and me. I worry every single day. I can't help it. 
It hurts me to watch my children suffer. Then Operation Blessing offered to help. First, we built Susanna and the boys a sturdy new house. My biggest dream was to have a safe home for my children, with rooms, beds, and a table so we don't have to eat on the floor. Her new home has a kitchen, bathroom, beds, table and chairs, just like she asked for. Thank God. Not only do I have a new house, I also have a refrigerator, pots, spoons, plates, and other items to care for my children. Then to help her provide for the daily needs of her kids, we gave her what she needed, including training, so she was able to start a business selling food from her new home. Susanna said she now earns nearly three times what she used to make selling on the streets. My brothers and I are happy because they gave my mom a house. Now we eat three times a day. My children sleep comfortably now that they have their own beds. They are safe, happy, and content. Thank you. I am so grateful. That thank you goes from Peru, that wonderful family, all the way to your home and to your heart if you're a member of the 700 Club. You're part of that outreach. You're part of building that new home. You're part of providing a livelihood. Not a handout, but a hand up to say, we love you. God loves you. We want to see you thrive and survive, not on one meal a day. God wants you to have an abundance, and we want to help you get there. That's you when you're a member of the 700 Club. That's what you're doing every day. All around the world you're doing it because you cared enough to give to say, yes, I want to be a part of it. I want to join with tens of thousands of people that say, yes, let's make a difference in the world. Let's be there for people in their time of need. Let's provide for them. And most importantly, let's preach the good news all around the world. You're a part of all of it when you join with us. If you're not a member, I encourage you to join with us right now. All you have to do is pick up a phone and call us, 1-800-700-7000. If, if you're already a member, I, can, I would ask you to please consider increasing. We've got a lot of different club levels. You can join at 700 Club, which is $20 a month. We also have 700 Club Gold, $40 a month. 1,000 Club, $1,000 a year, that's $84 a month. Whatever level God is moving you to give, do it right now. 1-800-700-7000. Now, when you call, make sure you ask for Pledge Express. That's electronic monthly giving, the bank doing all the work. We can send as our gift to you, Power for Life, monthly teaching CDs. So if you like that, ask for Pledge Express when you call, or you can go on CBN.com and you give monthly on the giving page. You automatically sign up. You can also text to give. You can text CBN to 71777. Either way, do it right now, 1-800-700-7000. Ashley? Judah Martin is a skateboarder with a dream. He's practicing to become so proficient that he'll be able to compete professionally one day. But just last year, Judah thought his dream was shattered when he crashed on his board and was facing a lifetime of possible paralysis. Judah came in, I saw the blood, and he said, Mom, I need help. Heather Martin's son, Judah, had his share of skateboard injuries. The 15-year-old practiced constantly with dreams of going pro. This one would be different. Heather's daughter, Madison, had been recording Judah on her iPad when he fell hard in their driveway. I watched the video, and when I realized that he had knocked himself unconscious, I took Judah, put him in the car, took him up to urgent care. They determined he had no feeling on his left side. He couldn't feel anything. 10 minutes later, Judah's dad arrived from work after getting a text from Heather. You know, his neck was flopping all over the place. He was shaking. His body started to go into shock and he was trembling. And at that point, you know, my heart began to break and he had his eyes closed. So I, I grabbed his head and pulled him into my chest and just started praying in the spirit over him. And as I grabbed him to pray, he reaches up, grabs my arm and says, Dad, don't worry, God's gonna heal me. When he said that, faith that shot through me. Urgent care doctors called 911 to have Judah rush to the trauma unit at the Children's Hospital of the King's Daughters in Norfolk, Virginia. At the time the ambulance arrived, 
Over a dozen doctors and nurses were waiting for him. And I think that that is when I started to come unglued a little bit because of how serious it was. It was just a bustle of activity. I mean, there were so many people poking, prodding, asking questions. And at that point, the neurosurgeon and the team that was in there, he looked and he said, get him into a CAT scan and an MRI immediately. And I just broke down and I started crying. And she met us after that first scan. Everything kind of started to come unraveled at that point. They said, hey, listen, there's something going on. We don't know what it is, but we just found a spot on your son's brain. And when they found that spot, man, it just is like a gut punch. Scans revealed the tendons connecting Judah's spine were almost completely severed. Judah could be paralyzed. There was a moment where I felt the Holy Spirit ask in the most gentle way, in this moment, do you still believe that God is good? And I became so completely and utterly convinced by the goodness of God not even knowing what we were going to hear, what we were going to see, what they were going to say. Jacob stayed with their son overnight while Heather went home. He knew he needed to pray, but says God challenged him in a different way. I, I looked at my son, and at that moment, I just felt like prompted at the Holy Spirit. like, take a picture of him, put it online. And I felt like the Lord challenged me, say, I want you to trust your friends. I want you to trust the body of Christ to get up and pray for you and your family. And at that moment, it was like three in the morning. I was like, probably no one's gonna see this. But for some reason, it just caught fire. And we, we were getting texts from all over the country at that point. First thing the next morning, one of Judah's doctors came into his room with test results. Judah had suffered a near fatal concussion and would need a neck brace for his body to heal. But there was something else. The first doctor came in at around seven and said, hey, we don't know what happened, but that spot on your son's brain is gone, completely gone. I remember jumping up in the hospital room and I was like, yeah, come on, Jesus. It really shook me because I really thought about it. And I thought of all the people who have been paralyzed and that could have been me. After eight weeks of rehab and more prayer, Judah went back to his neurologist for a final checkup. And he comes in the room and he goes, all right. He said, I've, I've looked at uh, Judah's MRI. He said, and honestly, it doesn't even look like he had an injury to his neck at all. It doesn't look like anything even happened. That is God. Only God could do that. As for Judah, he's back to doing what he loves. God is so gracious, he healed me. Because of him, I'm skateboarding and living a good life right now. Thinking on that is always good because no matter what I'm going through, I always have in my heart that I know that God healed me and I can tell others about that and help them come to Christ. That is why we have to surrender every day to the Lord and say, God, I invite you into this day, whatever it looks like, whatever it holds, I am choosing to walk by faith and not by sight. I am choosing to trust you with the outcome of my day. So for anybody that is experiencing trauma or has experienced loss, I would challenge them and say, Surrender your days to the Lord. Trust him because he's a trustworthy God. Seek his face in all things and surrender all things to the feet of Jesus and watch him. Look for the fingerprint of God in your situation and in your circumstance. I promise you'll see it. Amen. Talk about a warrior woman. I love what Judah's mom just ha just said. Look for the fingerprint of God in whatever situation you're crying out to him for, and you will see it. I believe that you won't just see one fingerprint. You'll see his hands all over you, all over the situation, all over the loved one that you are praying for and believing a miracle for. God sees you. God loves you. And the amazing thing also that happened with Judah's mom is she heard the Holy Spirit say to her, are you choosing to still believe even in this moment, even when your son is in a hospital bed and doctors are saying he might be paralyzed, are you still choosing to believe in God's goodness? And I just believe that that's a challenge for all of us today. Whatever situation we're going through, choose to believe in God's goodness and that he wants to work a miracle in your life in whatever situation you have been asking him to move in. And Gordon and I are going to pray for you and your needs. And we're going to believe 
that God is going to do a miracle. But before we do, we just want to continue to encourage your faith. And here's some more amazing miracle testimonies. This is Martha. She emailed us saying on December 27th, 2022, Gordon prayed for the healing of severe left knee pain that felt like a dagger jamming into the knee. I immediately knew this prayer request was mine and I claimed this healing power for myself. I felt a warm and cold sensation on my left knee, just like Gordon had stated, and I felt no pain when getting up. I started walking without the severe pain that had uh, plagued me for many years. I started to cry and praise the Lord. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. As Lisa sang during a, a program, Ashley prayed, there's someone whose right side of their scalp is sore. I'm not sure from what, but you know. Believe that God is touching you right now and resolving the issue by the power of Jesus' name. Receive it now. I knew that was for me. I received the healing and am pain and itch free. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Let's join in believing and believe just as Heather said, believe that God is a good God. He wants to come to you. He wants to heal you. That's his will. His will is not for you to be in trouble, not for you to be injured, not for you to be sick because nobody's injured in heaven. Nobody's sick in heaven. Nobody is having a concussion in heaven. It's just not allowed. That's the will of God. So let's pray that God's will would be done on earth in your body as it is in heaven. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, we come to you believing in your goodness, believing in your glory. May the glory of the Lord be manifest in our bodies now, in our lives, in everything concerning us now. Stretch forth your hand to heal. Touch now in Jesus' name. There's someone you have radiating extreme pain in the right side of your neck. It goes down to your shoulder and to the upper part of your right arm. God is healing it. You just felt that sensation. It's like a cool uh, hand breeze going throughout your shoulder, up to your neck, down to your arm. God's touching you, healing everything concerning it right now. Be healed and be set free. Ashley? Yeah, I believe someone's watching. You have an issue with your with your tongue specifically. It's it's difficult for you to talk. It's swollen. There's actually an infection. And doctors are, are pretty concerned about this. It could be severe. It could cause other problems. But I just believe God is touching you right now in the name of Jesus. The swelling is going to go down even right now. By the end of today, you will be back to normal in Jesus' name. You're going to go back to your doctors and they're going to be surprised. And you just tell them the truth that it is the Lord who has healed you in Jesus name. Uh, I think there's several people you've gone through a series of, of troubles in the past year and it's, it's literally one thing after another after another after another and you're saying is God still with me is God still good to me just lift your hands to him he wants to fill you with righteousness peace and joy he wants to manifest his power in your life just begin to praise him, recognizing he inhabits the praises of his people. Praise him and see your victory in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've been touched, let us know. Let us share in your good report. Give us a call. 1-800-700-7000. Here's a word. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from all their destructions. God bless you. We'll see you again.